Welcome to the Bird Podcast. I'm Shobha Narayan. In this episode, we are going to talk about Amur falcons. I'm here to see if I can spot the annual largest migration of raptors in the world. Will I see them? I don't know yet. Asha, yeah. What do you think? My first reaction is 22,000 kilometers all the way from top to bottom and then it decides to rest in India. So that's one of the best things for me and it's such a tiny bird but the attitude it has when like I I saw the close up it looks like really determined and it's it's kind of passionate about what it's doing because I can see it in its eyes like I saw it in close up for the first time today and it's phenomenal it kind of gives you that goosebumps. So Harsha where are we going? Uh, right now we are going to Akishay, huh. a small village on the borders of Nagaland and Assam. Hmm. The roads are going to be like really bumpy, hmm. but it's worth it. So we are going to be seeing lots and lots of the falcons. So off to Akishay. In that uh, Haki in Canada is bird, <laughs> so <laughs> I always think of it like probably there's a connection to south as well. I've never seen a mass raptor migration before and I'm not sure what to expect. We know that these amur falcons or falco amurenses are roosting on these tall sal and teak trees overnight. We know that they are marathon flyers flying all the way from Amur land in outer Mongolia and Siberia where the Amur river the 10th longest in the world flows and gives them their name. They fly from Siberia to Somalia and East Africa and onward to South Africa. Usually we have to drive to Pangti and Doyang reservoir several hours away by car. This year we are lucky because a flock has decided to roost near Dimapur. The forest department has set up a shed in order to protect these birds from hunting. So there we stand in the cold waiting for the birds to emerge and they do. a few at first and then more and more why are they here to fatten up really they fly out in the morning to catch insects on the wings one of the constraints of filming with an iphone like i'm doing is that i cannot show you the vastness of what i see it's almost as if somebody has shook a blanket releasing a swarm of falcons that will soon fill the sky If there's one thing that dictates the life of these amur falcons it is insects. Lack of insects is the reason they left their breeding grounds in Siberia and Mongolia and abundance of insects is why they are here in Nagaland and surrounding states. In about a week to 10 days they are going to migrate to Africa and they are going to time this migration to coincide with the massive dragonfly migration that will happen at the same time. In fact these dragonflies will give them nutrition on the most arduous leg of their journey which is flying over the arabian sea non-stop over 5 days and 13 hours and if you think that's arduous for these birds that are about the size of a pigeon then think of the dragonflies that are making the same migration they will arrive in africa in time for the rains which will release yes more insects beetles termites locusts from the red fertile earth of africa Once they get to Africa they disperse widely and they winter there till about March April. A few years ago Dr Suresh Kumar from the Wildlife Institute of India along with some Hungarian researchers tagged about 8 of these birds. One named Manipur it was discovered made a round trip migration of 29000 kilometers and another made a round trip migration of 33000 kilometers. Another fascinating thing is that these amur falcons do what's called an elliptical migration making almost a figure of eight they go down one route and they take another route back why we don't know uh i think regarding amur falcons again like very little is known about them we, we don't know what's happening during the uh, breeding season in, in siberia and mongolia but when they come here you know like this is where the largest congregation happens Uh, in the entire world for raptors so i think it's a spectacle in itself it's more like a phenomenon and we don't get to see this anywhere else like it's just in northeast india and specifically in nagaland so once you move out from nagaland again 
uh, you're not going to be seeing them these big numbers because they're going to all disperse. You can see here, like, you know, these big numbers, you're not going to see them again. So <laughs> this is wonderful. Uh, I think we're glad that, you know, they come here and there are guests here. So it's exciting. Yeah. One of the guards tells us that there is another a wide open space from where we can see the falcons. And so we follow him there. And I asked our visitors what they thought. Uh, no, I think it's a wonder of the world. Uh, so many birds uh, together in both at in the evening and in the morning. We got to see the behavior different. It was you get immersed in it. You get overwhelmed by it. And uh, as birders, you also your mind says, why? Why have they chosen this spot? Uh, you know, are they getting feeling safe here? Are they getting food here? I don't know. Is the wind better here? So some scientific inquiry we want to do but otherwise the the poetry does overwhelm the prose yeah that's what it is it's magnificent as i said this is better than my morning meditation and it's so worth coming all the way here but there's another aspect to the story, one that has to do with conservation. Nagaland being a very, Nagaland being a hunting state. So it is part of the culture here. And also their attire, if you see, so they have feathers, they have hornbill feathers, mm. they have uh, uh, bear ka hair, mm. the tails of different animals. Mm. So it is like a part of their culture and history mm. and they're pr proud of uh, their, uh, uh, what do you call, their Tradition. like traditions and also for uh, hunting. Yeah. So this being the case, so it was quite uh, quite a shocker that uh, almost uh, more than 18,000 Amur falcons were being killed per day mm. in 2012-13. And there were also few of the conservationists who were quite vocal, including Bano Haralu, who was uh, uh, quite instrumental in bringing this story out initially, along with a lot of other people also who were working in the area at that time. And uh, fortunately, like even the department also swung into action along with other stakeholders. So this is not like a fight as to who was successful, who was not successful, but together along with communities. In fact, the communities were the people who were uh, instrumental in bringing about this change because no matter how much any other fellow will speak, it is ultimately the community who has to take the action. So the communities came forward and uh, in fact, they came forward in a very big way and they all decided together. Uh, there were a lot of... Uh, actual marathons, the running, uh, the thing, no? marathons conducted for children and a lot of educational uh, programs were conducted for children. Eco clubs were formed with also help of many NGOs. So all these guys came together and there was an effective, uh, what you call communication and even people absorbed this communication and they were happy to conserve. And for the first time, they were like, they were part of the conservation story rather than being the uh, perpetrators of like killing the birds and there is also again another part to it uh, this entire area where amur falcons initially were coming to roost the doyang reservoir so the doyang reservoir also is like a, a wetland which has been formed because of a dam the project so many of the people had lost their farms so they had turned into fishermen so they were using the same nets instead of catching fish to catch the amur falcons so uh, there was a lot of education given, uh, awareness given from uh, various angles. So this also encouraged them that uh, no, we should not do this. And there was a program uh, by NGO, uh, what do you call, uh, grain for uh, birds. Na? So you leave the birds and we'll give you grain. Some, some, some programs like that were undertaken. So overall, the people uh, became more aware. And uh, uh, even the Nagaland government declared the Amur Falcon as a state guest. So it is like VVIP treatment. So no one should kill any Amur falcon and it has to be respectfully allowed to go out. So that also was one of the big support which came from government side. And another support also came to the forest department from our another department, the rural development department. They issued a uh, order saying that anyone who kills Amur falcons, they will they, that village will be stopped off all development funds. So that also added to the story and uh, together the Amur Falcon could be saved in the next year itself. Like 2013-14 itself it could be saved. And uh, the numbers of killings came drastically down. And additionally also uh, we had uh, scientists come over from Wildlife Institute of India and also from Hungary. So uh, 
these guys, uh, they did the satellite tagging. We did for almost eight birds. Uh, if I'm right, eight or nine, I'm not sure. Eight, I think eight, if I remember right. So uh, until last year, the last tagged bird, which was Longling, it is named after the, after the Longling district. Mm. So Longling, that bird, I think uh, it may have probably have the uh, record of giving data for the longest period for a tagged bird. And it traveled approximately more than three lakh kilometers and probably seven times up and down. Oh, it's so, it's still there. <laughs> yeah, no, unfortunately, till last year it was giving the data. Uh, so this year, uh, the Manipur birds are still giving the data. There are uh, birds, uh, Englang, Englang, Ch Chulan. Ch so Chulan's uh, data we just uh, heard. So it has already moved out from uh, Manipur, Nagaland area and it's moving towards Odisha. Okay. So this is the latest info we have. So overall, so we can tell that, uh, I mean, outside of Nagaland, People may think that uh, like there is nothing happening here, but these sort of very big and huge conservation stories also are happening. So that's that is wonderful. the wonderful thing about Nagaland. Thank you. Yeah. That's wonderful. And that, my friends, is the heart of this heartwarming story where villagers, conservationists, journalists and marathon running boys all came together to save these mysterious magical birds. Now, there are many excellent documentaries about this conservation effort. But here is Bano giving us a glimpse. The Amur Falcon massacre story really began with uh, the recordings and the writings of a Singaporean traveller who was travelling the Doyang Reservoir areas. And she had posted on the Bird Ecology Group about her coming across these falcons which were being trapped and they were being killed and also kept as pets by uh, young people. So in the following year, in 2010, I happened to be in the area, the Dorian Reservoir, with a group of ornithologists. And uh, we happened to be in a site where we were told by locals that we were coming at the wrong time of the year, that we should in fact come in October, where hundreds and sackfuls of birds are harvested. So I couldn't, for the life of me, imagine or think what these were because I'm not an ornithologist, but these friends of mine were. So immediately they said, these must be the Amur falcons. That's when I first heard about the falcons. And so subsequently it was discussed in the group when we could actually visit this. So having got more details, uh, we finally made a group which consisted of uh, Ramki Srinivasan, Shashank Dalvi, Roko Hebi Kotsu, a fellow Naga from Konama village, and me. And uh, we had also worked together in a previous uh, uh, assignment, which had covered the entire landscape of Nagaland for a wildlife survey report for the forest department. And in that report, it clearly showed that awareness was a missing component uh, amongst, across, like in all these uh, uh, protected and reserved areas. So in Nagaland, the pe peculiar um, nature is that 97% of the land belonged to the community and 3% uh, with the government. So it clearly meant that anything that you do, you have to consult and work in cooperation with the communities. So this Amur Falcon story uh, proved uh, challenging and also rewarding because we had to work directly with the with the community. <laughs> Nagaland is a beautiful special place. Most of the state is mountainous with the Naga hills and the Patkai range passing through it. Bordering Myanmar is Mount Saramati, the highest peak. 88% of the population are Christian and there are 16 tribes. Although we didn't see the blight strogopan, which is Nagaland's state bird, we saw many other beautiful sights. What's my takeaway? Well, here you go. So we did it. We actually did see them. Um, what can I tell you? I mean, the, what you will see on film or what I say will not do it any justice. 
because for those of you who are, who are um, who would like to, you must come and visit Nagaland. You must come in November. You must come and see this, see these birds, because they are tiny. You know, they are not big raptors, but they congregate in such huge numbers. And we are lucky that they have chosen India as one of the migratory routes. And I think the scale and spectacle. For birders, it's very easy to see a small bird. You see beauty in a grain of sand, as it were. You see a small bird and you get so much joy. But I think many of us, especially in urban India, we forget the spectacle. We don't get to see it. And to see that spectacle, you have to be here in Nagaland because the Amur Falcons put on a show like no other. <laughs> Let's go.